So let's say you desire fire insurance, okay, for businesses, and you charge 200 CDs per month, and you have 12 customers. Your costs are rising, and you are thinking about increasing the price or your premium to 250 CDs per month. Now, the law of demand says whenever you increase your price, less will be sold. The higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. So as you are thinking about increasing your price, you are well aware you will lose some customers. But how many? Assuming we say you have 12 customers, when you increase the price to 250, will you have only 10 more, only, sorry, only 10 customers or eight? Will it reduce from 12 to 11 or 12 to 10 or 12 to five or 12 to zero? That's the idea of the elasticity that we are trying to study. Okay, the extent to which quantity demanded responds to changes in price. Okay, so the basic idea here is the elasticity measures how one variable responds to changes in another variable. Okay, it is a numerical measure of responsiveness of quantity demanded here or quantity supplied to one of its determinants. Remember, we have said a determinant of quantity demanded include the price of the good, price of related items, income, taste and preferences, expectations, and so on. And determinants of quantity supply could be what? The price of the product, the um, cost of inputs, technology, expectations, and so on. We talked about them in the previous lecture. So, when one of those determinants I just listed change, how does quantity demanded respond? The extent of the response is called elasticity. And for that matter, we can have price elasticity of demand. We can have income elasticity of demand because price is a determinant of demand. Income is also a determinant of demand. And price of related goods, okay, is also a determinant of demand. So we have something we call a cross elasticity. We'll go through that one very quickly towards the end of this first section. Okay, so that's the idea. What is price elasticity of demand? Okay, so like I said, when you hear price elasticity of demand, what should you think about? You are like, okay, I saw yogurt or I saw um, iPhone. When I reduce the price, people will buy more but to what extent would I sell more? What extent will buyers respond to that decrease in price? Will my customers jump from 100 to 1,000? Or my customers will jump from just 100 to 102? From 100 to 1,000 is a huge jump. Elasticity is huge. But from 100 to 102, it's just a very um, marginal increase in the number of buyers. So that place we see elasticity is very small. So elasticity is pretty much the extent or the degree to which quantity demand and response to changes in price. It will be a, a response that increases your sales or a response that decreases your sales. Okay, that's the idea. And we have a nice and simple formula for it. Price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by percentage change in price, okay? So if you have these numbers, you just divide and interpret. We'll go to the interpretation shortly, okay? Take for example, this um, slide here, there is an, a price rise of 10% by the law of demand. Once price has gone up, we expect a fall, a decline in quantity demanded, and that we are told it's declined by 15%. So you increase your price by 10% and there's a more than proportionate decrease in the quantity demanded. So when we use our formula up here, percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price, we have 1.5 and we say this is elastic, okay? We will soon, we will soon go through the interpretation, but any number bigger than one is elastic. And it means that, um, 
there is a more than proportionate response. Okay, you just try to sneak in a higher price by 10% and you lose 15%, okay, of quantity demanded. Okay, so it's kind of a bad idea. You just did 10% and you are hit by 15%. Okay. So that's a formula. Um, there is something you should note here. Any line that looks like this or curve is negatively sloped. So when you use this formula, you always get a negative sign attached to the number. For example, the 1.5 we had here was supposed to come with a negative sign because this is a fall. A fall always comes with negative. Okay. So the next slide is just saying, look, all the time when we calculate, we'll get a negative number, but we ignore it. But we'll take cognizance or keep in mind that it comes with a negative sign. So we will drop the minor sign and report all price elasticities as positive numbers. Okay, so far so good. Is that okay? All right, let's keep going. You can always shoot me an email if you have questions. Okay, having provided a formula of price elasticity of demand, we want to learn how to compute them. Okay, so we have said the formula is percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price. Now, how do you calculate or compute percentage changes? Some of you will remember from your core math, a percentage change is the end value minus the start value over the start value times 100%. Okay, so look at this from A to B. From A to B, that means it's from 200 to 250, right? From A to B. So what is the end value? It ended at 250. It started at 200. And you divide by the start value times 100%. When you do the math, you will get 25%. Okay, so in the, on the previous slide, these percentages were calculated and we just divided. So life may not be that easy. You may have to compute this yourself before finding the quotient. That's what this slide is about. So, okay, very easy material. Now, what we did earlier on the other slide was going from A to B. So we started from here, ended here. Okay. Now, let's look at the op opposite, moving from B to A. From B to A. That means from B to A. So we are ending at A. From B to A. So it's always what you are ending with, the ending value minus what you started with over what you started with times 100%. This is supposed to be negative 20%. Like I said, we are ignoring the negative sign. Okay, so that was the percentage change in quantity demanded. Let's look at percentage change in price. Also, we are going from B to A. B to A. So, that we ended at 12, started at eight, okay? Divide by the start value times 100. This is what? 50%. So what is price elasticity from B to A? You are going to take what? Percentage, um, is this actually? Let me see, four, 12 minus, oh, sorry. Yes, the numbers are correct, but this is actually the quantity. Percentage change in quantity demanded. And this is percentage change in the price. So you divide 50 by 20. Percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price. Then you get 2.5. That is from B to A. 
and we saw on the previous slide moving from A to B. What is the point here? It appears that the direction matters if you are using this formula. If you are using this formula right here, this formula right here, if you are using this formula, looks like the direction matters. Okay, if you are going from A to B, you get a different number because the end and the start will be different from if you were going from B to A. You also get a different number because of that. And it shouldn't be so, right? Because it is the same, okay, stretch here. So why should the um, extent to which consumers respond be different from A to B or B to A? when we know the elastic the, the demand curve is a straight line okay now we are not as uh, 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 claiming that the elasticity is the same on a straight line it's actually different but on the same segment a to b okay it appears to be a problem that in an exam if a student did from a to b or b to a they were gonna get different numbers and sometimes it affects the interpretation so there is a cure for this confusion, that's the midpoint method. So rather take the end value, subtract the start value and divide by the midpoint. That way it doesn't matter whether you are starting from A, point A or point B. Okay. We have an example here from our previous graph. Okay. You can just pick anywhere, whether it's from A to B, or from B to A, this time you pick anywhere you want. So look, if they started from A to B, then they ended here. So the end value, start value, and this is the midpoint. 250 plus 200 divided by two. The midpoint is two to five. Okay, so you get this. And for the change in quantity also, you use the midpoint. The end minus the start, what is the middle of 12 and eight, right? From eight to 12, right? or 12 to eight. Sorry, from eight to 12. So 12 plus eight is 20. 20 divided by two is 10, that's the midpoint. Okay, and you get this. Now you can find your price elasticity of demand, percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price. You get 1.8, so this is price elastic. Okay, so practice these things. And there's an exercise here for you, okay? What is price elasticity of demand? Okay. When price was 70, quantity demanded was 5,000. When price became 90, quantity demanded 3,000. Even here, we don't know whether this is point A and this is point B or whatever. We just know this is how the demand schedule looks like. I want to find price elasticity for this uh, segment of the line. Okay, so as usual, you can pick any of them as your end point, any as your starting point. So they started from 5,000 minus 3,000, and then the midpoint, okay, 5,000 plus 3,000 is 8,000 divided by 2 is 4,000. And they get that. Similarly, you can compute the percentage change in price and then you can get 25%. And you divide percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price, you get 2.0. This is also relatively elastic, okay, price elastic, because it's greater than one. Okay. By now, you should know what price elasticity of demand is. We've said in the, for the, from the law of demand, the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded or the higher the price, sorry, the lower the price, the higher the quantity demanded, and the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. But to what extent, what is the degree of responsiveness? That is the price elasticity. There are some items when price change, you lose all your customers. So elasticity is very sensitive, very high. There are some items when price change, you don't lose any customer at all quantity demanded doesn't even change. So the degree of responsiveness is very low. So that's the idea of price elasticity. So what determines price elasticity? Okay. Some of them, you face them in everyday life. 
or in the past, whatever, your various endeavors. So it should be easy to identify the determinants of price elasticity. Why is it that maybe if MTN increase their price, they will not lose customers as Tigo would? So what determines price elasticity? Okay, the degree of responsiveness of quantity demanded to changes in price. Okay, now we are going to look at a few of them. There are other ones, but these are the main ones. Okay, now, so we'll use these examples. Example one, please pay attention. Example one, there is breakfast porridge and sunscreen. Okay, this is to protect you from the scorching sun. You know what breakfast porridge does already. Now watch here. The prices of both of these goods, okay, rise by 20%. These two goods, what if their prices both go up by 20%? Okay, each one goes up by 20%. The law of demand says you, you there will be decline in, in, in quantity demanded, but one of them will have a sharper decline than the other. That's the exercise we are doing. Okay, for the next five minutes. So this is the question. For which good does quantity demanded drop the most and why? Now, breakfast porridge has close substitutes. You can have pancakes, leptin, milo, and so on. Okay, so if the price of porridge has gone up, there are substitutes. So people might shun or abandon their breakfast porridge and move to substitutes. So breakfast porridge will see a huge decline in quantity demanded. Okay, so we are saying buyers can easily switch if price rises. Sunscreen has no close substitutes. By the way, some of these ones, they become a bit controversial, depending on how you look at them, but I just want to point out the general thoughts, okay? Sunscreen has no close substitutes. So consumers would probably not buy much less if its price rises. Remember, we are comparing two items. Okay, so it's kind of related. So what is the key takeaway point? The degree of responsiveness or price elasticity is higher. When close substitutes are available, of course, when close substitutes are available, if I can have alternative to switch to and your price go up, price goes up, I switch. So I'll respond harshly. Okay, so price elasticity becomes higher when close substitutes are available than when close substitutes are not available. Okay, let's keep going to become clear. We have blue jeans, the jeans that is blue, and clothing in general. If both of them have a rise in price by 20%, which good does quantity demanded drop the most and why? Okay, look at the reasoning here. This is narrowly defined. It's a jeans which is blue. So I have many substitutes. I can have khaki, shorts and so on okay but when you take clothing which is broadly defined there is no substitute for clothing okay so that's a lesson here that price elasticity is higher for narrowly defined goods than broadly defined ones if you take watch it, which is a local delicacy versus food. This is narrowly defined and there are plenty of substitutes. So when the price should go up, people will move away from it. So price elasticity will be higher. This is broadly defined. There is actually no substitute to food. So the price elasticity will be lower. Okay, people will not move away from food even if food should should have a huge increase in price. Okay, so this is the lesson. Price elasticity is higher for narrowly defined goods 
than broadly defined ones. Let's keep going. So we've talked about substitute. Availability of substitute can determine whether price elasticity is high or not. The, how broadly or narrowly defined the good is okay, also informs the extent to which quantity demanded responds to changes in price. The third one, insulin and Caribbean cruises. This is like a luxury and this is like a necessity. Insulin is used by diabetic patients to survive. So it's so crucial, okay. So price elasticity is higher for luxuries than necessities. If price of insulin went up, um, quantity demand would decline, but not as much. So elasticity is lower. Caribbean cruise is a luxury. If price goes up, ah, you can postpone it. You can, you know, forego. So people will respond hugely. So price elasticity is higher. Okay, at this point, now, let me go for the fourth one. But before then, at this time point, you should know what we mean by elasticity is higher. What should come to your mind? You must know that that should be clear in your mind to avoid confusion. When we say elasticity is higher or elasticity is lower, lower means quantity demand does not respond much. If you lower your price, you will sell more, but not much if elasticity is low. If you increase your price, you will lose customers, but not much because elasticity is low, okay, and so on. Now, another determinant of price elasticity is short-term versus um, long-term, okay? Let's say I pay a toll boot when I'm going home and toll boots are going to increase in the short term, I will not be able to make a decision and not demand the use of that road. In the long term, I can come and rent at a place that I can avoid the toll boot. So in the short term, people don't have time to maneuver, but in the longer term, they're able to change their decisions and respond to your increase in your price. Okay, if petrol prices have just gone up, short term, you cannot do much, you respond less. So elasticity is lower. But in the long term, you can respond to this increase in petrol price by changing your car to a smaller car or renting a place closer to your church or your workplace so that you don't have to pay more for petrol. Okay, so what's the key point? Price elasticity is higher in the long term than short term. Okay, you can respond, okay, largely in the long term when you have more time than in the short term. Okay, so this is a summary. Determinant of price elasticity, availability of substitutes, whether it's a necessity or luxury, whether the good is broadly defined or narrowly defined, or whether the time horizon is long or short. There are other ones like, oh, the proportion of your income you spend. If you spend only five CD of your income on daily graphic, then when, if daily graphic price should go up, you still buy, you don't reduce your quantity. So proportion of your income spent on a commodity can also tell whether you would respond uh, largely to changes in price or not. There are other ones like habit formation. If you form a habit of smoking cigarette, then even if the price changes, you do not decline or reduce substantially the number of cigarettes that you demand and so on. But these are the main ones, okay? All right, let's keep going. Okay, there are a price elasticity is closely related to the slope of the demand curve, okay? So let me probably do this at once. When a curve is flat, then it is relatively elastic. Look at this a small change in price. At this point, I don't need to remind you that this will be price, this will be quantity. So here we are, P1, price one, price two, quantity one, 
quantity two. What is the point of this? Where are we now? You know what elasticity is? You know what price elasticity is? You know what determines price elasticity? We want to tell you that even you can, you can actually inspect a demand curve and know whether elasticity is high or not. So the point here is that when a demand curve is relatively flat, like this one is flat, then elasticity is higher. Okay, people respond like huge. Now look at this, a small change in price. Look at the gap here. Small gap, a small gap. By gap, I mean GAP. A small gap here leading to a very big gap. Uh -huh. So a change in price leads to a more than proportionate change in quantity demanded. So there's a huge response, its elasticity is higher. So when the curve is flat, elasticity is higher. Look, for example, a curve which is not flat, but relatively steep. Look, a big change in price is gonna lead to a very small quantity. Oh, look at that. A big change in price leads to a tiny change in quantity demanded. So they, they are not responding much to price. Okay, you can do this by 10% and the change here is only 2%. So this is, uh, elasticity is higher here, elasticity is low. Relatively, this is more elastic than this. Therefore, please be aware that the shape of the demand curve okay, can tell you whether elasticity is high or not. And we are going to go to a variety of them. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Hopefully everything is fine. Remember our formula, price elasticity is percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price. Let's take the first one. What if you meet a demand curve, which is vertical, completely vertical? We call it an, an extreme case. It's called perfectly inelastic. Okay, I, I for inelastic, I. And you know how I looks like, I is vertical. So that is to help you remember that I for inelastic and I is vertical. So completely vertical is what? Perfect. Perfect means completely right. And inelastic means it is steep. And this is perfectly steep. Okay. So this is perfectly inelastic. Okay. If you remember your comment, let's, let's put in the number for the numerator. You see, there is no change in Q. It is staying at one place. So the change in Q is zero. There is no change. But price can change, right? So at the same, no matter the price, the same quantity will be bought. So as for change in P, we can have it. This is just a number for pedagogical reason to teach. So for sure, price can change. Let's assume it's 10%. But we are also aware quantity cannot change in this type of setting, in this setting, okay? So we put zero here and any number here and the result is zero. So you must know, it's your responsibility to know that for a perfectly inelastic demand curve, price elasticity of demand is zero. In other words, demand, quantity demanded does not respond to price at all. Look at this. You can change the price wherever you want. Quantity demanded is unfazed. It doesn't change. So, Price elasticity of demand is zero. You must know that a perfectly inelastic demand curve one is completely vertical and its price elasticity value is zero. We move from zero to a number less than one. So it is no more completely vertical. It is steep, but not perfectly vertical. So we call it inelastic demand inelastic inelastic like i said a very big gap here change in price leads to a small change a very big gap change in price leading to a small gap change in quantity so this is inelastic okay what does it mean when price changes by 10 percent for example we are we are sure that the quantity percentage change in quantity might will be less than that 10 percent they don't respond much as I depicted on the graphs before we even move to this slide. 
Okay. So a change in price leads to a less than proportionate change in quantity demanded. And that is why when you divide, the value will be less than one. So whenever you do the computation, you get a number zero, you know demand is perfectly inelastic. If you get a number less than one, we say demand is inelastic. The curve is relatively steep. Consumers' price sensitivity is relatively low. Again, elasticity is less than one. Okay. This, there are a lot of products like this. Okay. Some of them, it's harder to think of examples, but here, no matter the price, the same quantity will be bought. You can think of example as a salt. No matter the price of salt, if you buy one box, it's just going to be the same box. Um, maybe insulin, which is crucial for diabetic patients. No matter the price, the same quantity. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's probably not a good example, but that's the idea that they, they are not, they don't respond to price at all. Now, we've seen where price elasticity takes a value of zero. That's perfectly inelastic. We've seen when it takes a value of less than one. Okay, that's inelastic. Now, so from zero to less than one, we get to one. When do we have one? We call it unit elastic. In that case, when you change price by 10%, there's an equal proportionate change in quantity demanded. Okay, so the slope, okay, the steepness of the curve, okay, is intermediate. Okay, and how consumers respond to changes in price is also intermediate. Elasticity is equal to one. Okay. So you must know perfect inelastic is zero, inelastic is less than one, unit elastic is equal to one. Okay. A proportionate, if you change your price by 20%, quantity demanded will also change by 20%. Okay. Now we move to another one called elastic demand. Here, elasticity is greater than one. Okay. As I show that, you change price and there's a huge, a bigger response. So that's elastic, more responsive. So I showed you that the curve is relatively flat and consumers' price sensitivity is relatively high. Elasticity is greater than one. You must know all these things. We can ask you to calculate this in an exam and interpret. You calculate, you get 0 0.5. You say 0 0.5 is less than one. Therefore, that is price inelastic. Demand for the product is price inelastic. Now we move to another extreme case, right? Remember, we talk about elasticity of zero, less than one, equal to one, greater than one, now a big number, infinity, right? So here, what is the change in price? When the demand curve is relatively, completely flat, horizontal, there is no change in price. It's the same price. So this is zero. A percentage change in price, whatever you compute, will always be zero because price doesn't change. Okay. That is if you have a commodity which has this demand curve, like the market for potato or maize or corn can have this demand curve. And if you're a businessman, you must know the type of demand curve your, your product faces. Is it perfectly inelastic? They don't respond to price. Then you can change price anytime. If it is this, then you have to be careful, okay? Now, this will be zero. Quantity demand can change by any amount, okay? So when you have any number divided by zero, we are supposed to say it's undefined, okay? But sometimes it serves a good purpose to say it's a big number, infinity, okay? So you must know that perfectly elastic demand curve is horizontal and its elasticity number is infinity. Okay, so the demand curve is horizontal. Consumers' price sensitivity is extreme. They are extremely sensitive to price. Look at corn or potato. The corn from tamale or maize is not different from the maize in Kumasi. So immediately you increase your price, they will move to your competitor. You will sell zero, okay? If you increase your price here, you will sell zero. You must stay at this price then you can sell any amount. So that's why they are extremely sensitive. And the elasticity number is infinity. Okay, we are making good progress. Let's keep going. 
you can always slow down the video and watch, okay, uh, pause and so on. Okay, so elasticity will help you as a businessman to know whether you should be thinking about increasing your price or reducing your price. If you sell something which has many substitutes, we've said that elasticity is higher. Your customers are too sensitive. Okay, like the market for baked bread. If you increase your price for bread, they just buy another person's bread because their bread are largely the same. And if you sell insulin, which is very important, or you sell electricity because there's government intervention, that's a different story. But if there's a monopolist, okay, that is selling only uh, one touch SIM cards, okay, before Vodafone, there was only one firm selling then they are monopolists they are the only people they can change price anyhow okay so we just want you to be mindful and know that elasticity is related to total revenue how much money you make okay when you increase the price of your product maybe you run a restaurant you increase your price there are two effects because there is a higher price you will make more money but the higher price also means you sell fewer you lose some customers. So you must look at the balance, which one is bigger, okay? Increase your price, that's more money for you, but you are going to lose customers, so you are losing money, which is bigger. When the demand for your product is very sensitive, price higher, elastic, elast, highly, sorry, I beg your pardon. If your product faces a highly elastic demand, you should not be increasing price because you lose too many customers than you will get from the higher price. But if demand is relatively inelastic, consumers are not that sensitive, you can increase your price, you will enjoy the higher price in higher revenue, you will lose customers but not much because they are not too responsive, okay? We will show here from some graphs. So that's a guide for those of you in business, okay? So the graph here would show um, let me go to slideshow. Okay. So here, elasticity is what? 1.8. This is greater than one. So you must know it is elastic. You have demand for insurance. We've been told it is elastic. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, remember total revenue is always price times quantity. So that's a rectangle. Take your price, multiply by the quantity you sold, you get your total revenue. You decided to increase your price to 250. Okay, you are selling at 200. You increase the price to 250. This is your new. You were able to sell to only eight people. Okay, because it's elastic, 1.8 you lost four customers. So this is your new total revenue. You lost this part and you gain this part. You have lost more than you have gained. The blue here is bigger than the deep yellow here. So it's not a good idea for elastic guy, elastic demand guy to be increasing the price of his product. So originally, this is what you had. You now have the yellow. So you have lost this part, this blue part, and you have gained this yellow part. But you lost more than you gained. Okay, so you lost revenue. So be careful if you have an elastic demand curve. Okay. So key note here, when demand is elastic, a price increase causes revenue to fall. Okay. You lose customers too many. Now let's take when if demand is inelastic. So you expect a number less than one. Okay. This is it. At 200, you sold 12 units. This is your total revenue. You, you increase price to 250. This time you lost only two customers. The other time you lost four. Uh -huh. They are not too sensitive. Elasticity is less than one. It's inelastic, so this is what your new total revenue. Looks like the new yellow here is bigger than the blue you have lost. Okay. So 
So the lost in revenue is the blue. Increased revenues here all together. Okay. When demand, when demand, I beg your pardon, when demand is inelastic, a price increase causes revenue to rise. Okay. So there is an exercise here for you. Okay. Think about total revenue as also expenditure, right? If you spend 200 CDs, on a bag, your expenditure is 200. And what is total revenue to the company you bought it from? Also 200. So expenditure and revenue can be used interchangeably. Now, look at this example. I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds to think about it. Okay. Pharmacies raise the price of insulin. Insulin is a necessity so people will not run away from buying it, even if the price went up. Elasticity is low. So pharmacies in raise the price of insulin by 10%. Will total expenditure on insulin rise or fall? Or will the company's revenue rise or fall? Okay. Let's look at the answer. Okay. Since demand is inelastic, Quantity will fall less than 10%. So expenditure rise or total revenue goes up. Okay, demand for insulin is high. If pharmacists raise the insulin price by 10%, they will lose quantity demanded, but not up to 10%. So they still make money. Okay. Expenditure is what? Or total revenue is price times quantity. They increase their price, higher price, this doesn't fall much. So when you multiply, you still have a higher number than what it was. What is the second scenario? As a result of competition, the price of a luxury cruise falls by 20%. Huh. It's a luxury. You have reduced the price. What will happen? Will people purchase more or no? Patronize you the more or the less? What's the answer? The fall in the price will reduce your revenue. You have reduced your price. When price falls, you reduce your revenue. But you are going to increase sales. Quantity demanded will increase, which increases your revenue. Which of them is bigger? Since demand is elastic because it's a luxury. For luxury, demand is elastic. By now, you should know what we mean when we say something is elastic, demand. Demand is elastic for luxuries. Quantity demanded will increase more than 20%. So altogether, your revenue will rise. Okay, take some time and, you know, think about these things again. Okay. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Now, we are going to shift to supply. Okay, so... After talking about price elasticity of demand, you know, we move to a similar idea, price elasticity of supply, where we had quantity demand and we replace with quantity supply, the same idea. So we'll go through this very quickly. Okay. So we said when prices are high, sellers or producers are happy, they want to sell or produce more. So but to what extent, okay, the extent to which sellers respond to changes in price is a price elasticity of supply. Okay, how swiftly they can turn around and produce more. Okay, it's also the idea of price elasticity. And you will see the formula is, you know, similar percentage change in quantity supplied over percentage change in the price. Okay, so more formally, price elasticity of supply measures how much quantity supply responds to changes in price. Okay, like I said, we are done with demand elasticity of demand, we are looking at the supply side. Okay. So here, the midpoint formula is used, right? What is percentage change in quantity? 16%, percentage change in price, 8%, you divide, get 2.0. 2.0 is greater than one, so you know it's price elastic. 
So uh, here also remember, the flatter the curve, the bigger the elasticity. We've said this. The steeper the curve, the smaller the elasticity. This is supply curve. It can be this flat or it can be this steep, but it should be positively slow. So this is more elastic. This is less elastic or inelastic. So it's just a similar idea. That's why we take our time for that one. So look at this. When supply is perfectly inelastic, it's like this, and elasticity is zero. Okay? When supply is relatively steep, okay, elasticity is less than one, and it is inelastic. Let's move on quickly. When you get a number equals to one, it's unit elastic. And we know it means there's intermediate sensitivity to changes in price, okay, by sellers. Similarly, we go to a number greater than one, which is called elastic. When you compute, you get a number less than one. Okay, a small change in price leads to a bigger change in quantity. So they are more responsive, okay? So price sensitivity is relatively high and elasticity is greater than one. Okay, that's sweet. And similarly, if you have relatively or completely horizontal supply curve, that is perfectly what elastic. You must know the difference between perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic. Okay. I for what vertical and I is inelastic. Here, elasticity of supply is infinite, infinite. At the same price, different amount to be supplied. If price should go down, they will supply zero. Okay. They are extremely sensitive. Okay, you can always ask me questions in class when we meet. So, when we're talking about elasticity of demand, we talk about the determinant, right? Long term versus short term, broadly defined versus narrowly defined availability of substitute versus non-availability of substitute, necessity versus luxury and so on. What are the things that determine supplies elasticity? Okay. What can cause a producer to turn around quickly and respond to changes in price? And what can cause him not to be able to respond to price okay, more quickly or uh, big, uh, largely than that you would, you would expect. Okay. These are the key points. There are not many. What is it? The more easily sellers can change the quantity they produce, the greater the price elasticity of supply. So this is the idea. Okay, we said elasticity of supply is the degree of responsiveness of quantity supplied to changes in price. Some of the products or goods, you can't do anything about it. Even if the price is high, you want to supply more, you cannot. If somebody so give me 10 or 20 football stadia, stadia you probably need 10, 10 months to build it. So you cannot even respond to higher prices. But if you are doing bread and prices have gone high, you can turn around quickly and produce more bread. So elasticity will be higher for the bread than the stadia. Okay, so the more easily sellers can change the quantity they produce, the greater the price elasticity of supply. Now, supply of a beachfront property at Pram Pram or at Downfall, a beachfront property, is harder to vary than and thus less elastic than supply of new cars. Okay, you, you can easily supply new cars faster than a beachfront property. It's harder. So supply will be higher, Elas sorry, elasticity of supply will be higher for the cars than the beachfront. Okay. And here also the time horizon matters. Of course, if I have more time, I can supply more beachfront property. Therefore, in the long term, the elasticity of supply is higher than in the short term. Okay, I hope this makes sense. That's about it. Okay.
So relatively or comparing the supply of beachfront properties in elastic, okay, sellers cannot maneuver or turn around quickly to respond to changes in price. And the supply of new cars will be considered elastic, okay, relatively. Now, there is a question here. The population has grown. The demand for beachfront property and cars, okay, have both doubled. For which product will price change the most? For which product will quantity change the most? You should be able to answer the second one easily. There's beachfront, there are cars, population growth has increased demand. So they demand more, okay? Can you supply more quickly of cars or beachfront? If you can or cannot, which one would the price change? Okay, the most. Let's see. Now, beachfront property has inelastic supply, okay, because it's harder to vary the quantity supply. Okay, we've said this, so that should be clear. So don't worry about the demand curve not being parallel. It doesn't matter. When demand increases from year to year, you cannot actually change quantity supply that much for the beachfront property. It takes time, okay? Because you cannot increase the quantity supply eventually to come with a higher price. Okay. So an increase in demand has a bigger impact on price, okay, than on quantity. So you can always pause this, go back, reverse, and so on. Now, new cars. New cars can be thought of as having elastic supply curve. So this is relatively flat when there's increase in demand, okay, from year to year. Yeah, as for cars, they can increase quantity supplied fairly quickly. So it's a bigger jump. Okay, once you are meeting demand, price doesn't rise as much. So big jump, small jump, okay. When supply is elastic, like for new cars, an increase in demand has a bigger impact on quantity than on price. So the beachfront property has a bigger change in price and the new cars has a bigger change in quantity. Okay, this should be the answers to the questions. Okay, another idea. Remember we had price elasticity of demand. Now we replace price with income. Remember income is also one of the determinants of demand. So we have the formula as Percentage change in quantity demanded. This remains as a numerator as before, but the denominator changes. It's no more percentage change in price, but income. So this is how quantity demanded responds to changes in income. If your income were to go up, will you buy more? If you buy more for normal goods, by how much will you double your purchases? If your income fell for normal goods, will you decrease? Okay. Your, your purchase and so on. So this is also how quantity demanded responds to changes in income. As you saw from the previous lecture, okay, for normal goods, the higher the income, the higher the quantity they will buy. For inferior goods, the higher the income, the lower the quantity they will purchase. So when you compute this formula, you are going to get a, a positive number or negative. When it is positive, it means it's a normal good that when income goes up, this goes up. If you have a negative number, it means it's inferior good, meaning when they move in opposite direction, that's negative. When income goes up, quantity demanded, sorry, demand, yes, quantity demanded falls and so on. Okay. So you can compute this and tell whether it's inferior good or normal good. Okay. Then, Remember, we had price of related goods as one of the determinants of demand. So it is useful to think about, oh, if the price of Pepsi, if the price of Pepsi should go up, now move to Coke. 
what will be the quantity demanded of Coke? So it's a cross, it's cross from Pepsi to Coke, cross price. So look at it, change in quantity of good one. Good one can be Pepsi. And then change in quantity of good two, change in price of good two. So quantity of one of the goods, price of the other good. Remember, quantity of one good, price of the other. How does the price of Coca-Cola affect quantity demanded of Pepsi or vice versa? Okay, so this is how the formula looks like. Take the demand for the first good, the percentage change, and the percentage change in price for the second good. Okay. Here also, when you get a number greater than zero, that means they move in the same direction. If this goes up, this goes up. Then they are substitutes. Remember the previous lecture, substitutes, okay? When the price of beef increases, people may shift to chicken. Okay, if you feel chicken is a substitute. So they move in the same direction. Increase in price for one, increases in the quantity, increase in demand for the other one. So that is increase, increase, so positive. Okay, then they are substitutes. Complement, they are together. If shoes are expensive, they don't buy socks. So you get negative. If, if you get negative, it means they are complement, they move in different direction. If price of shoe should go up, quantity demanded of socks will fall. Okay, that's the opposite, increase and decrease. So when you calculate this to you get negative, it means you are dealing with complements, okay? So pay attention to these details, okay? All right, we'll move to something else called price controls. So price controls will be the uh, last session for this uh, lecture. Very interesting. Um, sometimes government has to make policies to protect some economic agents. It could be buyers, it could be sellers. Okay, maybe those who produce tomatoes, the farmers don't gain as much as they should. You know, governments can come in and make a law that, hey, this is a minimum price you should pay for tomatoes so that we protect these farmers. Or oh, chamber and hall is too expensive that, hey, all oh, landlords, you cannot charge more than 1,000 cities for chamber, for example. So these are the ideas of price controls, okay? Remember, one of the principles is that government can sometimes improve market outcomes. So government can step into the market to improve outcomes and bring some desirable outcomes that society would be happy with. So we define two terms in this price ceiling, okay? The first two actually will be another one. What is price ceiling? Okay, you know what a ceiling is, right? A ceiling is above, okay, on top. So a legal price ceiling is what? The legal maximum, okay, price at which a good can be sold. For example, rent control. If they say chairman hall should be 1,000 maximum, that becomes a price ceiling, the legal maximum price. And what is floor? Floor is down below, right? So it is the legal minimum on the price of a good or service. Example, minimum wage. Now look, you cannot pay restaurant workers less than 20 cities a day. Okay, that will be minimum wage. You cannot go below it. It's a price floor. Price ceiling is a cap. You cannot go above it. So let's get this straight. Ceiling is on top of your head, so it's a maximum. You cannot go above it. It's, it is illegal to go above a price ceiling. It is illegal to go below a price floor. If government says all waitresses should be paid 20 CDs a day minimum, you cannot pay 10 CDs. It becomes illegal. Okay. We use our knowledge in demand and supply to study price controls. So please follow me closely. Look at the market for apartments, let's say chamber and hall, and the rental price is here and the equilibrium quantity. 
So let's say at a price of 800 CDs, 300 chamber halls are demanded and 300 are supplied. You've seen from the previous lecture that this 800 becomes equilibrium price. 300 becomes equilibrium quantity demanded and quantity supplied and the market clears. Now, let's look at a term we call binding and not binding. Binding and not binding, okay? Now, this is our market for apartment chamber and hall. We've seen that the equilibrium price is 800. That means when you offer your chamber and hall at 800, people are willing and able, they take it and they pay for it. The market clears at 800. Assuming government says, okay, there is a new law. There is a price ceiling. Nobody should rent his chamber hall apartment above 1,000 cities, 1,000 cities. Now, we say such a law or a price ceiling is not binding. Why? Because it's like uh, the law is uh, useless. We are all trading at 800 and we are happy. At 800, the market clears. And you say nobody should go above 1,000. Yeah, but nobody is going there. Nobody is going there. We are all fine at 800. That's why we say such a rule, a price is not binding. It has no effect, actually. If we were doing 2,000, then you can say, oh, don't go beyond 1,000. That one will be binding. But here we already low crowd. We are at 800. And you are bringing a law that nobody should go above 1,000. Yeah, it can be a law in the books, but we call it technically it's not binding. We are not bothered. You don't even need to call your lawyers to keep an eye whether you are violating the law or not because you are doing fine. The market is clearing at 800. Now, look at another one which is actually binding. You see, this one was placed above the equilibrium price. That's why it's not binding. If we were to put a price ceiling below, it will bind. Okay, so look at the next slide. All right, price ceiling. Here, yeah. price ceiling is here, 500 cities. The market will clear at 800. When you offer at 800, people will take it and will pay sellers are willing to supply but government has brought a law a price ceiling that please nobody should go above 500 ghana that's a price ceiling the legal maximum here it is binding it is a problem the market is doing well at 800 i want to sell it at 800 the market clear government said no you mustn't go beyond 500 so that is a problem and it's binding. So that is a binding constraint. I really want to move up here. Okay. I really, okay. I really want to move up here. Remember this was 300. The number here was 300. Here they are only supplying 250. They really want to supply 300. And they know people are willing to pay 800. But government says no. What does it cost? It causes a shortage. At that 500 price ceiling, trace the supply. They supply 250, trace demand 400. There is excess demand of 150. And that is the effect of a price ceiling. It's creating a shortage. They are not willing to supply their chamber house. They will probably just lock it in their houses and stay there. Instead of 300, they supply only 250. They are not happy. So it creates a shortage. In the long run, people can convert their chairman horse into something else. They use it to make a factory or, for example, or something else, <laughs> right? In other words, this used to be 250. It has now brought, brought, come down to 150, right? In the long run, they have time to change their mind and convert all their building to something else. 
because they are not happy with that price ceiling. So that's the idea that in the long run, demand and supply are more price elastic. Uh -huh. Because they are price elastic, they respond more. The, the, the 250 they were supplying has shrunk further to 150. As for demand, it used to be 400, it has increased to 450. Yes, maybe you are staying with your parents. You, are, you and your mother were paying 800 Ghana. Government has brought a law that it must be at 500 now, it's cheaper. So with time, you are also, you want to rent and leave your father or your mother's house. That's why the demand has moved from 400 to 450, for example. So in the long run, when people can maneuver and turn around because demand and supply are more elastic, the demand rather increases and supply, they get annoyed. They re redraw their chamber halls from the market. If you want to renew your lease, they say, no, I'm not renting anymore, which creates a bigger shortage. Remember the shortage used to be 400 minus 250. It's now 450, wow, minus 150. So I think this was 150. This is now what, 300? Um, yes, bigger shortage. So price ceiling always leads to shortage, okay, which is a problem. What happens under shortage? There will be what? Rationing. Rationing means people will form long lines. There will be discrimination. The seller will give it to maybe his friends, cronies. There will be discrimination because there are, there's shortage and there are long queues and long lines. But rationing actually means that if you want two bottles of Coca-Cola, they will say, no, you can only buy one bottle. Let somebody else also buy one bottle. Okay, that's rationing. Because there is shortage, you cannot get what you want. They ration it. And it is bad. Okay, there will be long lines. There will be discrimination. The product will be given to people who may not necessarily need it the most, but because they have connections or networks. Okay, so you can read this slide. Now, that was about price ceiling. Know what price ceiling is, the legal maximum price. Know that a binding price ceiling causes shortages. Now we are going to look at a price floor, the legal minimum. So consider the market for unskilled labor. Usually these minimum wages are binding on unskilled workers, secondary school graduates and so on. Okay. So this is the labor market for unskilled workers. The equilibrium salary or wage is six CDs okay, per hour, or for example, and 500 people are employed. Okay. Government says, no, I think they are cheating the workers. I'm going to bring a price floor. When a price floor is fixed at five CD, it is also not binding. Think about it. What is a price floor? Do not go below five cities. The guy said, yeah, but sir, I'm not going below five cities. I'm doing six cities. The market is clearing. So it's a non-binding a non constraint. You are saying we should not go below five cities. Nobody is going there. We are actually doing great at six. So it's not a binding constraint. You have to put a price floor above the equilibrium for it to be binding. Okay. Here you go. So look at this. At the equilibrium price, 6 CD, the market class, people who want to work, get to work, and so on. But government figures they are cheating the workers. So it sets a new minimum wage of 7 CD, 25 per sweat. It creates labor surplus, which is unemployment. Because the work employers are not happy. They want to pay 60. You said they should not go below 7.25. So what happens to demand for labor? Here, let's go back and see the previous slide. What was the, were the numbers? It was six and 500, right? Now it has reduced. It used to be 500. They are now demanding only 400 workers. No more 500. And as for the workers, 
supply of labor. Plenty of people now want to work because they are happy with their new salary. So more people supplying their labor hours, employees demanding fewer hours of labor, and it cross causes a surplus, right? Supply is bigger than demand. Supply of labor is bigger than demand for labor. So that's labor surplus, which is unemployment. So a binding minimum wage um, a price floor always leads to a surplus. Okay. And that's the unemployment I've shown you. Okay. Now there are examples here. I'm going to leave you to try. Try and go through and understand. Okay. The answers are after this. Look at this. What is the effect of a 90 CD price ceiling? The market is clearing at 100 and uh, there is a price ceiling of 90. What is a price ceiling? You must interpret it. Price ceiling says, don't go above 90. Wow, they really want to get to 100 and clear, but they say don't go above 90. So that's a problem. It's a problem. Look at the answer. The price falls to 90 cities because the government has set the law. Buyers would demand 120. Demand is 120. Sellers supply 90. They are not happy. And there will be a shortage. Okay, remember, a binding price ceiling always causes a shortage. So the remaining answers are here. I'll leave you to read them. Okay. So this brings us to the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching. I hope you followed. Uh, you can always shoot me an email or you can come to the office or when we meet in class, you ask your questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.